We are a majority in this country. And we're gonna win the election. Do you know what the red pill is? A red pill is someone who infiltrates a group and then destroys them from the inside. This place is spooky. Take it easy. You know what, guys? I'm gonna go back tomorrow. I think we should call the sheriff's office. What is that? What do we do, Amelia? We die. But we take some of them with us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tanya Pinkins, and uh, thank you for joining us for our sixth uh, session of Through a Black Woman's Lens. Over the last six months, we've partnered with HowlRound, and our first session was with TCG, and we've talked about Black women in business, Black women in theater, Black women in Hollywood, Black women in theater, sensuality, sexuality, spirituality, and today we're going to talk about and to and with Black women in academia. We have three brilliant minds with us. We are being um, moderated today by Crystal Chase, who designed this entire program for us. And you just saw the old trailer for my feature film, Red, Red Pill, which was my inspiration for having these conversations with Black women. Um, Red Pill will be released December 3rd through midnight releasing. You'll be able to find it on almost all of the streaming platforms. And it was my opportunity to try to tell a story through my perspective, um, the Black woman's lens. And that made me want to know what other Black women's lenses were about other aspects of life. Um, I sometimes teach master classes at university. And my last kind of part-time, full-time academic position was through NYU Atlantic School in acting. And uh, in hindsight, I think I was getting a preview of this critical race theory fight because I was actually shooting a uh, red pill during the semester. So I, I took two weeks off and I had a brilliant teacher, Christopher Burris, um, take over the classes for me. He now teaches down at UNC. And um, I know that if any, any academic students had a, a professor who had written, directed, and produced a film, they would have been ecstatic and felt like, oh my God, my teacher did this. My students said that I was the worst professor they had ever had. And when they um, got specific about what it was that I had done that was so terrible, they said that I had made them read like read aloud in the class an August Wilson monologue and that it was punitive of me to do so. Um, they fought me all through the class about actually performing one and it was on the last day of class that I had them read one because I said, they were like, my African-American friends wouldn't want me to do this and I didn't have any of color students in the class. And I said, but you're not taking a job from anybody. You're paying a lot of money at this university and you should have the opportunity to work with the finest material there is. And August Wilson is that. So they felt that was punitive and I was the worst teacher ever. And I'm sure all of you have stories to tell. So we were talking before um, we started the live panel about the different positions that people have in academia. So I'm gonna start with Lisa Thompson, who has the happy story. And she talked about it as being, you know, somebody who gets to work in the big house. So Lisa, tell us about your academic story at UT Austin, where you are an artist and a scholar. Were you at the McDowell Colony this year? I, I was at McDowell this year. And I also had an ACLS, which is an American Council of Learned Societies Fellowship. Um, but the story begins actually um, with me um, growing up, um, the first generation college student going to college, having parents that had never gone to um, university and navigating my way through um, with the help of the affirmative action programs that were in place in, in California. Um, and then Baki, uh, in, in the light of the Baki decision and all that stuff that, that happened you here. You gotta tell um, us what the Baki decision is. We can't assume anybody yes. knows what that is. So a um, 
white man applied to medical school, the University of California, Davis, which is part of the University of California system, includes UCLA and Berkeley. And, and he didn't get in and he sued because he felt it was, being, it was the beginning of the whole uh, push against affirmative action. And in the wake of that, we've seen the doors that opened for me as an undergrad start to close behind me. And it's been something that's been very interesting to, to navigate in, in the US. And I um, did my BA in UCLA and my MA at um, UCLA in African American Studies and was trying to decide between well, what do I want to do in my life? Do I want to be an artist or do I want to be a, a, a scholar? And my mentor at the time, who's still my mentor, said, you should do both. And I said, she's clearly insane. Um, and I uh, worked at the University at UCLA in a program for under underrepresented students running an editorial lab. And I was on the staff as a, the a director of this humanities lab at, um, at UCLA. And I'd go to these meetings that were campus-wide with faculty from across the university to talk about different kinds of issues. And whenever I have an idea, it would let fall flat and someone else would say the same thing who's a faculty member. And then they would be like, let's do that. Um, and so one day, um, Greg Saris, who was a native and queer um, artist and scholar, pulled me aside and said, you should go get your PhD because it's just, you know, you you think and then I can listen to you if, unless you have one. And I went to, it was the same program he actually went to, funny enough, at Stanford, got my PhD in modern thought and literature and went on and went and um, got to meet um, uh, different folks. And it was, it was an interesting journey. You know, at that time I was decided to start writing um, my play, a play and ended up being part of a whole group in San Francisco. So I met Coma Domingo with all these people who were kind of hanging out, but I was focused on getting a PhD because I realized as first generation person, I didn't want to be a starving artist. That was not cute to me. So that was that was my decision to, to, to pursue academia. But the play, but the art just kept coming and coming and, and, and being, you know, okay, you have a play. I never sent single female out to anybody that would get a call saying, we want to do it in San Francisco. We want to do it in LA. We want to do it off Broadway. And I was the whole time like fighting it. It was interesting. Um, and got tenure. I was told when I got hired that, you know, we know you have this play that's going on, but we, we, you were actually hired to be a, a scholar. And I took that and I said, oh, okay. And then I was off Broadway and got a rave review from the New York Times. They're like, oh, we're so proud of you. Yours is great. Um, and when I got hired now, from left university, State University of New York, Albany, and came to UT, hired me as an artist and a scholar. And feel like, oh my God, I can be my whole self. And I'm also went from English to black studies. So being fairly intelligible to everybody and what exactly I was, um, so it's interesting to be in the belly of the beast in many ways, right, um, in terms of how people are seeing Texas and uh, all the moves are being made. But um, I'm here to say that we can't throw Texas away because the, you know, stats come out by, the, by Pew uh, and back in the, earlier this year that the majority of Black people live in Texas. So we throw away Texas, we throw away Black folks. You know, there's a large the majority, like, it's exactly the, how the stats are falling out. Basically, it's the biggest um, population of black people for uh, per state. We're now above um, Georgia. So, now I know you to be a blackly black black woman, mm -hmm. and yes, you are an artist and a scholar. I don't know how you've navigated this uh, this system. The system yes. that is. I mean, I think academia is is probably tougher than the corporate world. It's the clicks mm -hmm. and the and the, and the, if you don't like, they will have you out of there in a minute. Your students will have you out of there. My students had me out of there. How have you done it? What is the secret? Mm. Great mentoring. Um, the, the what I learned from my dad, from my mom. Um, she, she was uh, always just studious. Just you know, want to learn different things. And my dad was. Uh, a man that played the corners. So I, I, I learned, to, I hang out with him at the bar barbershop and hang out and also you know, go, go with her to church. So I think that having both of those things and respecting both of those parts of black life, not to study it, but because you love it and that's home, I think it sustained me in ways that were important, I think. But okay. Yeah, so Okay, so getting deeper into this, Zama is also at UCLA, right? 
Oh, yes, I am. So and you come from South Africa, Africa, Durban, right? Okay, so tell us Born about your Durban. <laughs> So first of all, lovely meeting all of you, beautiful uh, Black women. Uh, truly an honor. I was telling Tanya um, just before we went live that um, I had shared with a friend of mine, Nundumiso Dembe, um, who's an actress and also a playwright. And she just said, um, she, she said, I love Tanya. Um, and she had amazing things oh. to say about you. So that just speaks to your character. And I also just wanted to say congrats on this film because, um, you know, I think that uh, for you uh, um, to, first of all, it's brave, you know, um, and necessary. But We're also, <laughs> I love it because the, you know, um, scholar Sadia Hatman talks about the idea that, um, you know, storytelling is probably the only form of reparation that we might have access to. And so there's just so much power in that. And, you know, that is how we disturb history. That is how we disturb the archive. That is how we can start imagining ourselves, you know, on our own terms. And so I really just wanted to say that I recognize it and I'm inspired. So thank you. <laughs> Oh, yes. And then I have to introduce myself. So I went on a tangent there. So, yes, my name is Zama and um, I'm currently doing my fourth year, just started my fourth year in my PhD at UCLA in cinema and media studies from South Africa, uh, where I worked uh, in mainstream um, radio broadcasting for years and as a voice artist, did content production. And it was at a point when I had a rather horrific um, experience, you know, in terms of being an artist and existing in a white institutional institution or just being institutionalized. And, um, you know, I was trying to um, find some kind of like agency. And, um, and I think that um, that is when I then decided um, to try and merge both these worlds, the academia and the um, and the creative work, because um, those worlds should never be um, seen as separate. They are inextricably linked at all times. And so I wanted to also say to you, Lisa, um, thank you for sharing that um, and your journey um, in academia thus far. And um, is there anything else, Tanya, that I'm forgetting? Um, I think that's a good start. That's a good start since I didn't do the reading of the introductions. I find that I, people tell you about themselves in far more interesting ways. So. Mm -hmm. Africa was saying she wasn't in the big house at the university. So she's going to tell us about the other, the other, the, the fields of the university. Oh gosh. <laughs> yes. So I came to academia in a very roundabout way. I started, uh, first, I would like to say first and foremost that I am an artist, uh, but artistry doesn't always pay the bills. So sometimes we have to do other things. And the other things that I had to do was to, you know, share crop in corporate America and also in the retail space. And so that was my main um, background as far as work history and sort of kind of came to academia through, through God. I mean, that's where God placed me in that moment. And, you know, when I look back on it, because I'm no longer working for that particular college uh, that brought me into academia, I must say that never had the verses of Ephesians that we fight, we do not fight flesh and blood, but we fight spirits, mm. you know, demonic spirits in the, in the earthly realms. That never became so alive until I stepped into an academic setting, which kind of blindsided me because I knew the cutthroat nature of corporate America, but I was kind of fooled with the idea of what academia is as far as this idea of community. And so I worked uh, in the... Uh, communications office, which is why I said that I am a field Negro because there are tears in academia and staff is not really looked at or appreciated the same way as the students and the faculty are. Tell us more because you didn't get into some juiciness. You know, I listened to in class with Carr and Dr. Greg Carr, who's a professor at, at uh, Howard, he says that faculty is not even appreciated at the level that students are. So, you know, clearly there's demarcation oh, there as well. Definitely. I mean, students are at the top because they're the product, you know? So whatever the students say goes because we need them because we need that money. We need that grant money. We need, you know, the help from, you know, the U.S. Department of Education. So they are the upper echelon. They are the top tier. But 
I, do, I did find that in the academic space that faculty did have more agency than the staff. Now I'm working in communications. I'm basically the voice of the college, but my voice, I had no voice. I, you know, the things that I felt like the college, because, you know, most colleges at that time, I was, uh, went to this particular institution uh, in Western Washington. I won't give any names, but it's in Western Washington, very small town. Um, <laughs> Very small is there a town. Involved um, in this? Are we on a under a gag order? Sort of, kind of. So you know, uh, because of my experience, because of the way I had to leave, um, I am sort of, kind of bound to not say their name. But it is in Western Washington, very small town. I won't say how, what I used to call the, the the name of the town. You know, I'm gonna be nice. I'm gonna be nice. You know, but it was a very small town, very, very uh, predominantly white town. Um, they didn't even want the college there because they were running around with Trump banners and uh, Confederate flags. And the town and the college itself was considered to be liberal, but it really wasn't. You know, it, it was that, you know, um, hypocrisy sort of situation. Like we're really liberal, but, you know, as long as you stay in your place, we're liberal. Mm. 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 Ladies, so, for each other. You know, I want to jump in because um, as I'm listening to the stories, and, and this is the thing that I think um, I am coming to the realization of, and I mean, of course, I'm much younger than all of you, and, um, you know, I believe, and I'm excited about as well the importance of us having intergenerational conversations, right, because um, you know, we often have these conversations. We're not the first people to have these conversations, but if we are not speaking intergenerationally, then I think that um, we both miss out, you know, on what's to be learned. But um, I think that having navigated, um, just that's why I said institution, because whether it is um, a radio station or, um, you know, a studio, uh, you know, or whatever the case is, I actually have clutched my pearls at the realization that the experience almost mimics, you know, it's almost identical. And so, um, you know, and, and I think that as well, um, Lisa was talking about, you know, the, I think that what, what we all share here in common is this idea of also being first generation PhDs. So first of all, you know, um, doing a PhD and then having to explain to our parents, our communities, who don't really understand what this world is about, right? Um, and um, and then adding the experience of me not just being, um, you know, a black woman, but also being an international student because that's a different level of precarity. But I think that Lisa, you were speaking about the idea of community, and you know, and I think that for all of us here who believe in the emancipatory potential of education, and I think that that's what becomes so disheartening, right? When you go into academia and you realize that, well, it's still an institution, there's still capitalism. And so therefore those demonic sp spirits you're speaking of, that's just, it's capitalism and all these other isms, right? That are actually, um, that never really go away or anti-blackness, it just takes different forms and it follows you um, with whichever space you are in. But on the idea of us having pursued a path of being liberated through pursuing education, that can never happen if we are alienated. And so I think that the importance of community and finding kinship, um, that is, I think, a, a radical tool, you know, um, a radical uh, technology for survival. And I think that maybe that is also something that we need to stress upon about how do we actually survive and how have we been surviving and how can we imagine radical futures for how we want to exist in these spaces as artists and as scholars. I love that. I'm, I, I'm sorry, Tony, I'm going to jump in here because to tie together two things that, that Zama said and, and also what Africa said about this. First of all, is this people have somehow, despite the fact that I always say this, academia doesn't have, and still the chair have a show anyone even talking about. Medicine has all those TV shows, but we have all the propaganda shows. Uh, we have all these shows about the legal field. People really don't have a sense of academia, um, and we have a little taste now with chair, but this idea that, you know, people say, to you, so you're off all summer, and you're like, oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> how the hell am I off all summer? I'm like, so, because these books just magically appear that I write, just, you come out of nowhere. I just, you know, it's, classes begin, and here's the syllabus. Um, so there's that, and the intergenerational conversations are so important to have. I've never in my life, though, felt such 
um, walls between the generations until in, until now. To seeing people donning t-shirts saying, I'm not my grandmother's whatever. And I'm like, oh baby, who is your grandmother? I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, so if, you, if, you, if you're not having conversations every week with somebody 20 to 30 years younger than you and 20 to 30 years older than you, then you're not in, a commu in community with, the, with, with our people. And academia is, is the real world. And people feel, I think that because of this hollow ivory tower thing, that folks kind of get, get comfortable and to find out, what's that? Oh my goodness, I might be bleeding back here. <laughs> I've been, you know, so I think that understanding that it, the, it is the key to navigating the whole society where you've gone to, where'd you go to school? I mean, I didn't, I didn't see this, this week's um, Insecure, but um, you know, I also went to, uh, to Stanford, and this idea that I mean, black. She, I mean, she was talking about AKs, whatever. But I'm like, it's really black Stanford that she was showcasing, and that it's a whole world. Um, and I got there, and I was like, oh my goodness, you know. And being clear that there are people in the community who look like me who are not first generation, who have grandparents that ran HBCUs. We're legacy, uh, and we don't have a conversation about black folks who are legacy, and how you know, first gens and legacy people have different experiences, just put it that way. So I wanted to raise that, but yes to everything. What everyone is the class say. thing with academia? Yes. What is the class situation Ooh. inside academia? Because I ended up at Carnegie Mellon, there really weren't any black people there in Pittsburgh, but you know, is there a class thing between legacy people, international people, first generation people? What's, what's that? staff people are we doing clicks like that within blackness i mean i it's never been so evident to me <laughs> um about yeah classism and um and and i think that i and and also and that is why at times i have to let's say as um whatever you know because I, I don't really subscribe to the idea of a black middle class because that's such an unstable position but um you know not to delve on that but um i i have to as as a person who's in the academy but um you know had a grandmother who was a domestic worker um, and then had a mother who had to take herself back to school and that's a different experience but when me being in the institution that I'm in, which is a previously white institution, I have to acknowledge my proximity to power. And I think that as scholars as well, we have to um, be ethical as well then, um, you know, in terms of how we engage people in our community because, um, yeah, so the idea of class is actually real. I've never been in a room with smart people, sophisticated language who can talk about capitalism and not engage class and race. <laughs> and it's just like, uh, what world are we in? But, um, you know, uh, people speak around that. And then at an experiential level, you know, outside of what people are reading, but just really, um, you know, I think when I speak about having an ethical relationship to our communities, I'm speaking to the idea of how sometimes the black middle class can mobilize, you know, um, the rage of poor people. And that's the only interaction right um and so in our day-to-day -day, how are we actually because and, and maybe that is i mean it's not for us to resolve um i don't know if we can resolve that but i think that um we are getting some ways we can be honest about those tensions and um yeah how do we negotiate those tensions do you think as an a person from the continent that you can actually understand what those tensions are for Black Americans? Well, now you're speaking to something more nuanced, right? Uh, because, you know, we've been speaking to the idea that like, yeah, we all know that Blackness is not a monolith, but, you know, and, um, but however, and I think that that's why it's so important to have a diasporic consciousness, because then we can get over the idea, we can understand that Black people are under siege everywhere that we are, right? Um, and that um, I navigate a, a different um, kind of experience being an international student. So just at a pragmatic level. So now we're speaking about ideas of nationhood and how people are excluded from, you know, from citizenship. And then what does that look like? So at a very yeah. pragmatic level, that actually looks like me being an international student and not having been able to visit home because I'm in a student visa. And so when we speak and, 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 and then the idea of class. And so when you have a tenured professor 
who's been out of that experience or maybe for a very long time or has never experienced that, they don't understand, um, you know, what it actually, you know, what you are navigating. Um, so I hope I'm answering your question. <laughs> I mean, there's also the sense, of, the, the sense that it happens every year at graduation across the U.S. People are doing black graduations. Zama, we're yeah. having some challenges with your signal. I'm going to ask if you can get closer to your internet. You actually are freezing for us. Um, so like oh. what, the next, what you just said, I didn't hear you. No, oh, I heard her. I can't hear you now, Tanya. Oh, wow. Oh, so I can hear all of, of you. Yeah, I can hear you. How about you, Africa? No, I can hear all of you just fine. Okay, well, then maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just to me so we'll talk, we'll, um we'll africa what down. about the classism for you i mean do staff get do staff talk to students talk to professors or is I that i don't think that all staff have the ability to because i was in communications i had the ability to really reach out and form connections with um, with staff and with with other staff members, with faculty, with students, which I found at the institution at that particular institution that I was working at, they didn't do. I didn't understand how you could be the voice of the college and want to be so cliquish that it's like, listen, this is what we're going to tell you that you're going to talk about or that you're going to do. I mean, actually, when I came in, like they were like basically the pariah of the college, the communications department, because of the fact that they they did not interact well with you know faculty they did not try to form you know um a relationship with uh faculty and students and if they did use faculty or students it was just like the ones that they kind of cherry picked that was like in their little clique with the president you know with all the other groups that were really really cool with some of the donors because a lot of the donors of the college actually were graduates or alum of the college so it was really cliquish and I don't have that click mentality. I'm from the East Coast. You know, I'm from Jersey. I don't play that. So, like, I'm coming out there, like, totally, you know, <laughs> disrupting everything, that, you know, they had going on. But they called me out there to do that. And then when I started doing it, it was like, oh, my God, like, she's a problem. Mm -hmm. There, one of my um, uh, guests on one of our sessions, we talked about how there's an article uh, from Forbes, I'll send it if you like, about how black women always come in as the pet, the favorite, everybody's excited about how great they are, how talented they are, the work they do. And then suddenly they become perceived as a threat because their work is outshining other people's work and then they get forced out. Is that an experience any of you are possibly in the middle of or have in your past? Yes, Africa. That actually was the, that is my experience with this particular college. It started with me just trying to be a good team player. Uh, we were covering a story about an alum who uh, had graduated and went on to work for the Met, very prestigious, uh, uh, you know, museum institution of art. And uh, the girl that I was supposed to work with, she was kind of like dragging her heels. She had one on vacation. And so I thought, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker. I'm a theater maker. I have experience in, in, you know, creating videos. So let me help her out and just kind of show her the ropes. She came from a background of news and journalism. So she didn't have the background of creating like a polished piece of work. And so I, you know, created this whole presentation to try to help her. And she smiles in my face and says, thank you very much. And goes beelines to our uh, new uh, content director and complains about how I'm trying to take over and, you know, how she's offended at what I did, like I'm trying to take her job. And so then I get called into the principal's office and then told that I'm brassy. And I had never felt so offended in my life because number one, I know what that means. I'm a wordsmith. So basically what you're trying to say is that I'm an obnoxious black woman, all because I was trying to help. I don't think like, I, I, I mean, and it was just such a defeating experience because we're talking about one month into my experience at this college. And I'm in this, I'm gonna say me ghost white cracker ass town where I'm being looked at 
just to go to the store, you know, and people are looking at me like, oh, I thought we counted all the Negroes in the town at the last meeting. When did this one sneak in? And so I'm thinking the only protection I have is this college community. And I'm realizing I have no community anywhere. Mm. I'm sorry that happened. That's very alienating. I mean, I think what Africa is underscoring too, what it means because people don't realize like, why do you teach in this particular state or this institution? It's like the NFL, you, 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 know, you, you can't, um, it's, it's the way position they have open this season. And that's where you end up going. You're, it's a national job market. So then we end up being isolated, um, mm -hmm. alone or being one of the few. And then, so you got three black people uh, in your college or the whole you know, university, the town, I've navigated that. And then, so people are now sort of think, okay, do cluster hires and bring people in together. But there are differences between, you know, between us. So, you know, how, you know, oh, you were the single woman, kind of cute. And then the, uh, the married people are like, uh, no, uh, we don't want to bring her, have her come to the front with her, her gumbo. All right. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's very complex. Um, very complex. So, but, you know, I think that what I'm also hearing here is the idea that, you know, <laughs> inclusion, because the buzzwords right now, equity, diversity, inclusion. And um, but I'm hearing all these stories of just compounded trauma. Right. And um, racialized, gendered and all of yeah. these things. And um, so what we are seeing is that actually inclusion does not equal radical transformation. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's when those limits of like representations and that's what like my work also tries to interrogate, you know, in terms of because um, it, ca it really cannibalizes off this trauma informed um, need that we have to be seen, right, to be legible to people that um, do not love us and sometimes at the worst hate us. Um, and so to be seen or to be visible or to be in a room does not actually mean anything. And so I think that we need to have like radical conversations about like, okay, so then what does radical transformation actually look like? You know? Um, yeah. In this challenge, yeah, go ahead. I just, I found that, you know, the, the terms, you know, diversity and inclusion, while they're grand terms, have become sort of like just the new version of affirmative action where, you know, companies, corporations, you know, institutions of higher learning are saying, we want to be diverse, we want to be inclusionary, but that just means, okay, I'm going to cherry pick this person so I can have this, this face in my office to say that I have representation and now we're done. We want your face but we don't want your experience. You know, it's like the saying, we want the, you know, they want our rhythm, but they don't want our blues. Like that's that's really what it has, has started to come down to. It's the same way, even with the students. I saw that, uh, you know, international students were a big draw for that college. And a lot of those students came from, uh, from countries and, and from the continent. And when they came there, they were just, they were just numbers and they didn't have a space really for these students to express themselves, to, to really understand. And so this is the experience that you're giving these kids. And, you know, I ended up doing a playwrights uh, conference while I was working there out in LA. And the uh, gentleman, one of the uh, younger playwrights that I was working with happened to know about the college. And I said, I will tell you right now, I would not let, I would not send any any black person that I know and tell them to go to the school. Like, I don't care how prestigious it is. You know, at this point, I, I personally believe just from that experience that HBCUs are more necessary now than ever. Because I, when I was a college age, the idea was like, oh, well, do you really want to go to an HBCU? You know, then you're targeted. And I'm like, no, because the whole idea of college outside of getting that degree and getting that paper so you can get that paper is to have an experience of getting to know yourself and learn yourself and have community. And that is what is so needed for us as people is to have, to understand and have community. Now, I'm really concerned about what's going on though right now at Howard and uh, but we have the takeover of Howard right now. Yes. You know, the HBCUs have these $100 million endowments, but our students are living with black mold and they have housing insecurity. So, uh, it's complex. 
Yeah. What do you guys are in there? I mean, I'm all for HBCUs. I'm with uh, Malcolm X. We can't let them teach us. But then I hear that there's respectability policy politics in the HBCUs and that, you know, they have to kowtow to the people who are giving them their money and, and the donors, et cetera. So yeah, it sounds to me like we are seeking redemption from institutions. And um, I just don't know if that's possible. Um, so whether those institutions are occupied by black people um, or people of any other race, like in, that's why I use institution because it's like part of an entire structure. It's a machine. And um, and so that is why I'm excited about the fact that, um, you know, um, I'm in conversation with um, you know, I would say, cause I've been reading Lucille uh, Clifton. So I would call all of you two headed women, um, <laughs> you know but um, these two headed women who refuse to be boxed but um, you know, you are scholars, you, you have minds, you are also creatives. And so I'm excited about um, the role that black feminists or black women, um, you know the role of the imagination, you know what, what we are doing to sort of like imagine ourselves out of this mess. And I think that um, that is the kind Kind of possibility that I'm excited about with our work because um, I'm so sorry to get theoretical but and I don't particularly stand for France Fanon because it's problematic but I see that there cannot be any ontological resistance in spaces that have been built for and by whiteness and all of us that is what we've been trying to do there's no reconciliation but I'm like <laughs> dying to share though that like I have such joy in my work, mm -hmm. even in the institution. I mean, when I was at, in, in, the, in the institution where I didn't want to particularly live, um, and but with the largest, I think, English department population of black students in the um, whole system. And I'm still in touch with some of those students. I mean, and it, it was just like a love fest every week. And I knew that if I wasn't here, they wouldn't be getting this. I had to fight oh. the course on Toni Morrison. Oh, the whole course. I, I was in that class. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so crazy. And they were like, you know, do, we, do we need a, a whole course on her? Oh, you know, no. I mean, it was just fight. fight. And I, I'm Seely from Color Purple. I had to fight all oh, that. No, I'm sorry. That's, that, 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 that's, that's, um, that's, that's uh, Sophia. Sophia. So oh, did you have life. a spirit? Is that something you get the joy out of fighting to no. get that thing? No, I, that's part of the story. I, want, I, I tell people because I, I, I live in walking to my classes and just the, the, it, it just was I just man those I mean, and I, I I run into them sometimes in New York I'm like oh my god professor they follow me online it's like <laughs> and now they're you know doctors and lawyers and um, social workers and they're out in the world and I, those are my seeds. You know, and, and you know, right, they tried to bury us, but they know we were seeds. I'm seeing them. So that was just 20 years of teaching. Um, and then I came here and did the same thing. And th these students, next level. And when I got here, I had resources. So I could bring a Tanya Pinkins to give a real master class. I could bring Coma Domingo, Issa, De all these people I could bring into the university because I was in these different worlds and bring them together and give pe people are still talking to me about. Oh my God, I sat in the room with this person. Now look who they are. And I didn't realize, and thank you for bringing them in. So there's that. And I'm, you know, I'm working on that now. I named some things for black folks as a the visiting performing artist named after the black queer sister that start bringing performance into our department. We have our own gallery. I mean, so in, in a bad day, I can go down to our gallery and see work of black artists. Um, so- How you getting away with this in Texas? That's what people don't understand. I, I, my, my hashtag is this is Texas too. Oh. People don't understand. It's like don't sleep, don't let anybody because I'm from Cal I come from California, so I know what stereotypes of places are about. Oh, they're all blah blah. blah. They're all fake. Are they? They all this. Like, I hate California. Right? Really? You hate the beaches? You you, you, you mean you hate the, the mountains? Do you hate the food? Do you hate the the gardens? Do you hate the farmers markets? I mean, I don't walk me through that. So I love New York. I love everywhere I've been, and I realize Texas is more complex than that. My family migrated from Louisiana to California and some of them stopped in Texas and they're still here so I've got another side of my family you know what I mean so it's it's, it's always more complex and there's a lot of resistance here the women woman that's fighting the supreme court for women's rights I met here that's my friend Amy Hector Miller a white woman radical who is not playing games has been you know so it's 
it's more complex, but I, the, 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 all that stuff is true, but then I'm like, oh my God, but I'm also in a space where I can um, now teach a course on black feminist creativity and, and just, you know, just, just bathing in it. But what just freaks me out is the students, you know, always want to turn to, we shouldn't be criticizing the work of uh, black um, scholars for, well, we shouldn't be doing this work at all. It should be, it shouldn't, it should be you're, you're opening up to white people to see, it's like, they already know, this is for us. This is for my son to know there's more than our, 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 the black life and black death. There's, you know, so I, I don't know. It's just, I want to also share that because I feel like I'm a fraud sometimes in quiet moments. People are like, oh my God, it's so horrible. I'm like, it is all those things, but I can't lie about the other stuff that it is too for me. Please sure. share that syllabus with me um, yes. on Toni Morrison because, um, yeah, I've been raised by her words. And, um, and I think that, um, and, and you know, this is what she did, right? Um, being able to navigate both institutions, the, lit the literature world and the academic world and using her imagination. And I think that um, so that we can start imagining ourselves differently. And, you know, this, um, um, and, and I want us to kind of dispel the myth that the arts are not lucrative or that people cannot survive because that's a lie because I have seen them, but maybe they are just not black women, right? So we then... <laughs> get into the idea of resources and um, access to resources. And I love that um, you were speaking about um, the fact that, you know, it's become this expansive um, experience for you to be able to not only feed your art, but to be in an institution, having proximity to those resources and then disrupting the syllabus. So you're disrupting the institution and raising other, you know, and raising another new feminist, black feminist, you know, um, consciousness. So I think that that's the, and that's the radical work that black women, that gender non-conforming people are doing in these institutions. And that is not shared enough. Yeah. Africa, so how do you mix your art and academia? Um, actually, I didn't. So hmm. I was hired to um, be a, a, a writer for communications, and that was all they wanted. I wanted to come in and share, you know, my experiences, but they didn't want that. But God always has a way. God always has a way. Yes. And so because of the fact that my editorial director did not want to deal with the arts because they didn't, re she didn't respect the arts. I got all the art assignments. And so one of those assignments happened to be um, for a theater group that was, that had just formed in the college. It was like a grant that they got a Mellon grant that they were just uh, basically experimenting with, with this class that was dealing with immigration at the time. And so they were doing an improv play about immigration. And so I was following these groups of students and the professors from the beginning stages all the way up until uh, the show opened. And I'm watching these children go over the edge as far as like, well, well, how do we do this? And how do we honor their stories and blah, 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 blah. And so I'm watching the professor not really give these kids a response. And so I let them know that it's not, you don't have to worry about whether or not you're honoring their story. You just have to be the witness. Mm. And that's all you're required to be as as, you know, the theater maker in this space is the witness to be the witness to their stories. Mm. And it ended up becoming part of the play. And so mm. <laughs> and so in the middle of the play, they're talking about their experiences. And then they're like, and Africa Brown said X, <laughs> Y, and Z. And I found it just so ironic. I'm like, well, look at God, because all this time you've been trying to silence me and the people who I've been wanting to connect with the most, which would be the students, ended up respecting my voice and respecting what I had to say in a space that I am familiar with where I live, which is the theater. So. I wanna to say to people listening out there, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and Crystal will bring them here um, for us to ask our, our panelists here today. This is such an exciting conversation. So we've got an attack on education. I mean, I think that this attack on CRT is an attack on education period. When we have legislation against teaching things that hurt people's feelings, then everybody has a right to say, well, teaching no, no, about no. 
not people's feelings, white people's feelings, because we when our feelings been hurt for a long time. So it's again well, right, right. But <laughs> you know, once their feelings get hurt, then somebody else gets to say, well, my feelings are hurt by this, and then we get a class action suit, not and then the government gets to say, we can't teach. We cannot publicly teach mm. because too many people's feelings are hurt by public education. So what do you see happening with all of that? Ooh, when the things that I'm, all the seeds that are out there are gonna be, are teaching. And that's, and so that's one, and hopefully we're also we were belling. But we, you know, all the people who want to send me cookies during after George Floyd need to be going to the school board now. It's like, okay, um, you know, uh, Crystal or whatever, <laughs> not you, Crystal Chase. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't want to say Karen because you know, but that's a whole that's like afraid because like, I don't have any Karen friends, but they do have some other friends who wanted to, felt so moved and horrified. It's like, well, but I need you to bring that same energy to the school board. We're trying to ban books by Toni Morrison and by, uh, and the story of Frederick Douglass. I mean. Well, that's your state. So how are you gonna keep teaching what you teach in a state where some of this has been banned? It's, it's one is interesting that has not come up. I'm, I'm in the, the blue bubble. So there's that interesting thing. And it's not, it's not K, it's not college. It's K through 12, which is where it really matters. But I've had students who didn't, they, these laws weren't on the books. They come to my class and I had them openly crying when they found out about the Black Panthers. They had never heard of them in their lives. Hmm. So it's, we don't need uh, anti-CRT to do what's been doing, done to the students that I've encountered here who, they were like realized, and they, the part of the crying was about the people that I loved and looked up to who taught me, lied to me, mm. or didn't know anything. Because mm. I'm showing them that, you know, the Angel Davis documentary and uh, um, the Eyes on the Prize, and they're just like aghast. Mm. And that was like, I, I, teach, I was teaching a course, I stopped teaching because I was going to protect myself and our own health. We talk a whole thing about that before we hope before we go about black women in the academy and and health but i it was called drama um the revolution will be dramatized and looked at plays and films uh, presenting the civil rights movement black power movement and then um black lives matter and th and then giving them a chance to at the end of this class create work about a movement that, that's important to them so whatever it is some people dealing with you know veganism but some and one student was um, transitioning at the time, and I said, "Well, maybe you want to do something about ACT UP." And the student looked at me like blank face, never heard of ACT UP. Something that would, they need to know that would save their life. That mm -hmm. just blew me away. So we we're already we've been doing we've been doing this before they even start this dust up. These students don't know anything about any of these movements, and it's not like ancient history. ACT UP is not ancient history. So um, yeah, that's what. It's, it's in on. my last year at uh, this school at NYU, the school had just finally decided as a school that they were no longer going to teach. This is a university that there was only one right way to do a scene. I was kind of aghast that they had ever taught that <laughs> because I've certainly <laughs> never taught that. But um, I try to teach students to think and to be self-sufficient and to trust their own instincts and their own ways of knowing. And I think that a lot of the pushback I also got as a teacher is that students want you to tell them what is right and to tell them if they've gotten it right, rather than tell them how to figure it out and to come up with a decision that they can, they can live with. Because that's ultimately what you gotta do for your whole life is make a decision and accept the consequences of it. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you all about your thoughts on that as people who are teaching. Well, for me, I'm not a teacher. I'm, I'm you know, a storyteller in the sense of I'm telling these stories, the stories of the college that will entice people to say, this is why I want to come here. And um, for me, I think that 
even the essence, like to break it down to education, it's all about storytelling and the story that we want to tell as a nation, the story that we want to tell as Black people. And my issue is, is that our stories just aren't being told the right way. For me, to tell the story is to really to get at the heart of something. And, you know, what, what was bothering me as far as telling these stories is that, you know, it was a more it was more about marketing than it was about telling the story and it, and marketing at the heart of that is manipulation i want you to feel a certain way so you can buy this product or i want you to feel a certain way so you can subscribe to this service and so i don't deal that way and my and my pushback was always do we have to try to manipulate people or just say like, these are our truths. Like, you know, this, this college do, you know, we do have issues, but we're working on our issues. To me, that is honest. And, to, and for me, I would be happy to say, you know what, I, I have issues and I would want to be somewhere where I know that they're working on their issues other than you saying that we're so great. We have 300 days of sunshine here, which was a lot. And, you know, all these great things about why you should come here and then you come and it's not what it is. But does that sell? And since universities are capitalist institutions, aren't they competing with everybody else? Yeah. I so mean I'm asking. I think that, you know, in certain ways that they are, but in certain ways, you know, I think that the truth at its heart is powerful and that those that will want to be a part of that college are going to come anyway. You know, if you're, if you're you know, a, a small college and you're trying to compete with Harvard, you know, there is no competition, right? Like, but if you're a small college and you say, this is what we do and this is what we do well, then I think you will get attract the target audience that you're really looking to attract. So there's a question that came in. Um, do you think that people of the global majority can truly get a holistic approach to learning in white institutions? Hmm. Wow. That's a serious question. And I think that... Um, you know, it, it's it's something I also wanted to extend upon what Africa, you know, um, was talking about because, you know, people love talking about these institutions, love talking about decolonization, but we love talking about decolonization as well. And um, really, you know, what does it really mean to enact decolonial forms of knowledge production? And so meaning that we cannot always rely on institutions to do that work. But I'm also seeing something here because, you know, like Africa, you're talking about the ethical work that you are trying to do while you are navigating the institution. You know, um, Lisa was also sharing her experience. Um, and it's like, in, in as much as um, this work brings you joy, I'm hearing a lot of um, just what does it mean for Black women to be constantly performing this labor within these institutions just so that, you know, um, we can kind of all survive. Um, and, you know, and, and then again, I think the part that we're talking about having intergenerational conversations because, um, A, I mean, um, I'm a younger scholar. So, um, you know, as um, scholars, as creatives who have had more longevity in terms of uh, navigating those institutions, what are the, and how can we also draw from, I don't know, and for me, I draw from um, ancestry, you know, ancestral memory, ancestral wisdom, because I know that I cannot rely on a VITS or a UCLA or any other institution to teach me things that, quite frankly, my ancestors, you know, um, I already knew coming in. So I, I think that it's having a different approach altogether to how we are, you know, entering the institution and what we are trying to do. But I'm excited about the fact that um, we are, this, this conversation in itself, this is decolonial knowledge production for people who are listening to be learning, taking away, um, you know, this idea that um, access to, but taking away the idea that education is not just tied to an institution. Um, yeah. I love that. That part, you know, for me, I grew up a little different. I, I've always felt like intergenerational my whole life because I am literally the last human of my generation. And that generation spans a very long time. Like my grandmother was a slave and a sharecropper. Like 
I was born late. So I got the chance to experience different things and the idea of, uh, and the beauty of having elders who will teach you about a time when you weren't alive that will give you an appreciation. My father was a Black Panther. So, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of education and, and knowing our history and knowing ourselves was very prevalent in my household. And so, you know, I was always able to go out in the world and, and have this level of confidence of knowing, like, I know who I am. And that is because it started at home, you know, and my parents are didn't- Are you know. writing the book? I'm sorry? Are you writing the book, Africa, so we can get this history <laughs> of ancestors? Are you it, writing the book? It's coming out through my plays and, and my screenplays. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have another question. How do black women protect their mental health in the academic space? What are the tools? Always pay yourself first. Second Always. And third. First, second, and third. <laughs> <laughs> so mind, body, and spirit all, and then you go out into the rest of it. And if you find yourself having considering some unusual workload for me this month. Um, I was on a very important committee. And so I had to recalibrate and only do maybe one that in a day. But uh, I, I have a running joke that I use with my friends. I'm like, if this uh, machine of this way this country operates is designed to kill us, am I going to help them? Mm -hmm. um, and never explain to people your um, availability. Just make, figure out what, what you need to get done. You know, my meditation time, my exercise time, and prayer. Um, um, mind, body, spirit. Yeah, and then I'm available at eleven. I used to just say, "Well, I work out during that time." You know, it's like, no, I don't have to give you my itinerary. I'm available at eleven mm -hmm. on Tuesday. Boundary. Hello. <laughs> but it's feeling like feeling I'm gonna be accountable. Like I'm not. Oh, the fact I'm only I'm available that late in the day. It means I'm lazy. You know, I get up at five five a.m. You know, but that's my time. And so doing your work when you're freshest and purest. That's why I, I, I start to understand our ancestral stuff. That things that get embedded in me. I realized even dealing with my just my child. I'm like, oh, so some things he's not gonna understand until I've been dead for 10, 20 years, and that's okay. Because that's when things that my mother taught me, I'm hearing it very loud and clear, all of them when the pandemic started. Hmm. All their practices of like, oh, it was always there, but it just came into a sharp uh, focus. Um, remembering her, when our rituals, we used, to, we used to walk together. And I, you know, and since the gyms were closed, I was walking and I always walked, but I'm not very big on gym, but we couldn't do it. Just thinking about that. So that's the way we're doing it, keeping those things. And what is my purpose? What am I doing? So when I go in the classroom, I know I'm passing along these things that I love, these, this archive of black um, brilliance. And I'm also a champion of black mediocrity. Mm. What does that mean? <laughs> that we get to be regular. I'm not, mm. I'm not trying to celebrate super Negroes. Mm. <laughs> to me, the quotidian, the day-to-day, Yes. Um, people that raised me and loved me and took care of me didn't get a MacArthur. They didn't ever got a Ford Foundation grant. They never got any of that. I have a picture of my grandmother in her maid's uniform on my desk. Mm. Uh, real clear about what you know what I consider I value. I love going to Mother's Vineyard. I'm not gonna lie, it's cute. But I also loved hanging out with my dad at the barbershop on Third Street and, said, and, and I mean loved that with his friends. And hearing, it was, what struck me more than anything was hearing what I learned in so, my sociology graduate course being said in the barbershop the same summer. Left school in May, got to hanging out with my dad and his friends. Same analysis, different words mm. about, the, about, about the social structure and what's going on in the economy. So I'm like, I know we're not stupid. <laughs> I know we're not any of those things that people think. That, that's, that, that's basic. And what drew me to my son's father, who is a Nigerian, um, so I, you know, my son, he says he's a, a true African American, um, right? Uh, <laughs> so we, I want to circle back to that whole thing about the you know second second gen Africans and first gen Africans and African immigrants and how that's all happening in, at the university. Um, but that is that's that sense of himself as 
I know I'm, I know I'm all these things. I, 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 I mean, you think I'm inferior? <laughs> Tell me more about that. That's a fascinating, go on. Um, <laughs> and he is super, super, super brilliant and all these other things, but I really want us to, um, to relax. And I, I love the nap ministry because people are following the nap ministry on, the bishop is not playing games out here. They <laughs> go down and nap. My mom would nap all the time. My favorite aunt would nap all the time. Every day, they had napping rituals. And I have all my mother's house coats in my closet. She's, you know, she's passed on. And so it's like, that's, so that's it. That's it. You know, it's like, so yeah. And I, you know, and get you a fine, um, uh, um, get you a fine, fine, fine uh, trainer. Keeps you inspired. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I'm gonna take that one. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Ladies, anybody yeah. else, any other tools for the mental yeah. health in academia? I think that um what you know, and um what I mean, I think that a lot of us had to introspect um, you know, during the pandemic, um, really what fortifies us and um I love, and, and the idea that I even mentioned, you know, um, ancestral memory is because that is something that has been a constant to me. What fortifies me is Umsam and basically a translation of Umsamu is my altar, you know, the connection that I have with those people, like the understanding that life is not just here. It's more than what I see. Understanding that um, the experiences that I'm having are not new, you know, um, understanding that I'm connected to a larger lineage. And I think that Black feminism, you know, also does that. Um, but um, so spirituality, I think, um, you know, I'm South African, so we truly just dance. And it took me the pandemic to realize that the quickest way for me to get into my body and really that is a spiritual experience for me is to just dance. And there's this new sound, I'm a piano, <laughs> that I want all of you. I'll probably send a playlist to all of you because that's been changing my life. Um, <laughs> you know, but I'm a piano. It's basically a genre of house music that comes from um, South Africa. And that has it's I'm given me, listen, I'm just like, if you know, you know, hashtag Yanos is life. That has truly been giving me life because Black creativity, you know, I'm constantly inspired by, um, you know, what we create, what we make um, and um, getting closer to that experience for me or cultivating time every day is what has really kept me, um, you know, fortified. But community, you know, community is so important because, you um, then, and that's why I was talking about the fact that like walking into UCLA or any other room that I would walk in because I'm my grandmother's child, even though she doesn't walk on this earth anymore, I know who I am. So there is no power that is going to, you know, I, I'm not seeking validation. And I think that then that changes the narrative for how we engage with these institutions. Um, you know, so that's the thing that I've been leaning into, you know, remembering who my mothers are, remembering who my grandmothers are. The squad is so deep <laughs> and that gives me strength. Yeah. Tools, Africa. Well, dance has always been my go to. I always say that, you know, writing is the gift from God and dance is my conversation with God. And I'm a house head going way back. We talking shelter house head, body and soul house head. If you're from New York, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Zanzibar house head, New Jersey. So dance is very integral to my creative process, to my process as far as how I regulate myself, my body my spirituality but for me my biggest was prayer and just staying in step with God you know I know that God has a journey for all of us and we are we were all placed at the institutions that we were placed in for a reason whether it was for a long period of time or a short period of time like I was I was there for a reason. And I know that, you know, whatever God's will was in that time, it did get accomplished. Mm. And so I didn't have to be there for a long period of time, but being in a town where I couldn't even dance because they didn't even have bars, I tell you, it was like footloose. And so, <laughs> <laughs> that, so that, that got taken away from me, you know, having the relationship with God and realizing that, 
you know, I'm letting this place control my mental space. I remember walking to work and I would walk to work every day and listen to Yolanda, um, Yolanda Adams, you know, the battle is the Lord's and that, and just one day just getting convicted, like this is, you're not just here for this woman. You're not here for this reason. Like I put you here for a reason. And that propelled me to be able to, you know, deal with, deal with the stripes, deal with all the things that I had to deal with and, and, and keep moving forward until it just got to a point where I had to let go and that was okay. And it was really, I think, a time for me to claim who, what I was going to deal with and express my own boundaries because I walked away from that institution and I walked away with some money. Mm-hmm. Come because on. you weren't going to bring me out to the middle of nowhere, mm-hmm. treat me like you treated me basically force me out the door and make me choose between my dying mother and my job and think you were going to get away with it. Hmm. Yeah. That mm. helps it's not this daughter of a Black Panther. That's right. Nope. Mm. Mm. I think that answers partially one of the other questions, which is what do you say to your younger self to prepare for this space of academia? That's so interesting because I feel like it was a revisit of something that happened to me um, 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, I had met basically my, you know, I'm not going to even say his name, he's passed on, but, uh, and I do admire his work, but he, he um, was my everything. He was my poetry, everything. And I met him. And I gave him my work and it was a bunch of love poems. I did not dare give him any of my uh, revolutionary, more militant poetry. And he told me, well, you'll probably end up getting published because America's into bourgeois black females. And it just crushed my spirit because you're saying everything that I'm not. And you know, it, and it made me realize like, if this is what my voice is portraying in the world, then I have no voice and it really made me not want to write. So that's why I ended up going into the corporate space. And like I said, God always has a way, like if his will will be done. Like you are, I put you here to write girl, that's what you're going to do. And then I end up in this space where once again, my voice is being, I'm being told that my voice isn't valid, but this time I had the tools to say, uh, -uh, no, 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 no. You will not silence me. I'm going to continue and I'm going to do things my way. You can butcher, butcher and chop up my work any way you want to, but I'm going to give you me every single time. Yes. Things you would say to your younger self to prepare for academia, the academic space. There's nothing I could say. But mine would be more the, talking to the, the artist and say telling that again? I will be talking to the artist. That's the hmm. like, academic was like I was. That was that was the easy part for me. Mm-hmm. Academia is um, my art is my soul. Mm-hmm. And academia is my intellectual part, and that you know. But when you talk, you know, these are my you know, it's my baby. So that that was the part that I needed talking to. And um, what Africa said was, uh, "What's for you is for you." Like I said, I was writing. I mean, it was kicking and screaming. You don't believe. I mean. People were like, oh, they want to do the show. I'm like, oh man, when they want to do off Broadway, I was six, I was um, six months, eight months pregnant. I mean, it was like, I'm not. Do-. They opened off. He was six months old when it opened. Um, it will happen. Your art will make will, will force itself into the world. Um, mm. So I'll tell them that person. You know, that mm-hmm. is one is that um, you were right when you walked into the classroom for the first time though too and realized. Oh, you can do both. And my advisor, Harry Elam, who's president of Occidental now, he was like, you can do this other world if you want to do, be, be a playwright. Um, and knowing that an artist scholar is a valid um, title and thing that, and so I'm actually building the artist scholar initiative here at UT Austin with some of the money for my um, name professorship. And I'm going to have a symposium um, for bringing contemporary black artist scholars, but also paying homage to our four mothers and fathers. So Toni Morrison's an artist scholar, mm-hmm. Du Bois is an artist scholar, there's um, Kwame Braithwaite, all these people that p- passed away um, who I want to leave. And so that I want to honor them, celebrate bring together our community and also leave some, um, leave some, um, some crumbs for the, you know, the, the follow for those behind. Um, so that's the thing to tell myself that, and, 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 run, and have them run you, your coins, whatever world you're in, run me my my reparations. So that, that character in beloved stamp paid, you got that to do. 
And today's price is not yesterday's price. <laughs> <laughs> that is for sure. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So here's, I mean, I'm still navigating um, the institution, but I think that to echo, you know, what you said, um, because getting into the academy, I then, you know, that took me further away from my artistic practice. And so now I've been on a journey of actually reclaiming that and actually advocating for that in my scholarship. And that's the thing I'm most excited about. Um, and I, so I, I think that that would be the advice, you know, um, that I would um, give myself. But again, I think that it's the idea of community, you know. Um, again, I just cannot stress it um, enough uh, because the minute, if, if, if your idea is that you are seeking some kind of liberation or you are trying to get free, that is not going to happen in, you know, when you are alienated from a community. Um, so um, thinking of alternative communities or how we actually, you know, create those um, within the academy um, is uh, something that, um, yeah, that, 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 that I would advise. But I mean, I think that you're also doing very important work about, you know, claiming this dual role of like artist scholar. And I think especially for, um, you know, a lot of us who are black and, um, you know, as black women where you are the first gen or we haven't actually had an opportunity to even, that's why I was saying, let's dispel the myth that, um, the, that one can actually sustain and live a fruitful life, you know, being an artist. Um, but it's more so about how do we gain access um, to those, um, you know, uh, resources. Just one little thing to continue. Well, there's another question here and it is that, um... The pandemic brought a racial reckoning to the front doors of white America. What was it like navigating that in academia? And is there hope for the future with Gen Z? Always hope, always hope. Please repeat the question, Tanya. It's okay. Um, the pandemic brought a racial reckoning to the front door of white America. What was it like navigating that in academia? And is there hope for the future with Gen X? I'm gonna to speak to it first. I don't really feel that, the, the, that it brought a racial reckoning. <clears throat> I think what happened is it got very uncomfortable. And whenever it gets uncomfortable, people do whatever it takes to get comfortable. And then once it gets comfortable, they fall back to the things that they were doing before and nothing really changes. And as we have seen, just as a point of fact, the billions of dollars that were pledged for programs to help um, global majority people, the money didn't come through. I think for me, the best part of the racial reckoning was that for the first time in 400 years of settler colonial capitalism, people were able to, were forced off of the treadmill and realized that they didn't have to get back on it. And so I think that the capitalists thought this was going to create the largest body of exploitable labor since slavery. That did not happen. But what I don't yet see is anybody with a vision for a world that works for not even just all of us, but for the majority of us. So yes, there's always hope. I think the world is moving towards evolving towards higher levels of good, even when it doesn't look like it. You know, I think that uh, being South African and having been raised under Nelson Mandela's Rainbow Nation and then moving um, to the States and seeing this um, posturing of like post-racial, you know, uh, society, I think that I have a, and so I, I mentioned the fact that I'm South Africa because you know, I grew up, I was part of the Rainbow Nation um, generation and we were sold this lie, right? Um, and so we understand that actually they we are not in a post-racial society. So in terms speaking to the idea that last year we came into a reckoning, that's because we never had a real conversation around how we had never, you know, um, actually transcended or moved beyond. Um, you know, um, institutionalized racism because it still exists in it's sanctified in, in, in policies and, and what have you, you know. So um, if we are going to have like a real conversation, um, you know, um, about racial reckoning, 
it's that's what I've been talking about radical transformation you know um which has to uh, be reflective and so uh, I think that the second part um of your question I kind of forgot oh for, for generation z Oh, there's always hope. Um, I think that, well, because I draw a lot from Black feminism um, and, 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 you know, the work was created because there's a radical, um, you know, radical hope and radical faith and we are trying to build, you know, um, those worlds. So I'm always excited. And I mean, because I teach a younger, I'm a millennial and I teach, uh, is it Gen Z? Um, and I'm constantly excited. I'm constantly energized um you know by that intergenerational um exchange and the sincerity from the students who actually come into the classroom being so open to having the theory transform them and do something real in their lives that actually gives me hope africa I, like you, Tanya, agree with the fact that I just feel that, you know, there was, a, it was a unique moment with the pandemic and everything that happened because people were sitting at home. But when I was in academia, like I left in 2019, so it was before the pandemic, before George Floyd, and there was a sort of racial reckoning that was happening at the college that I was in that I happened to be a part of because the students were in an uproar, the faculty was in an uproar, and I just myself was in an uproar. And, you know, and I realized that I had to leave. But I, I also want to say about Gen Z, I don't want the onus to be on Gen Z. It is a collective. It is all mm -hmm. of us. You know, um, I'm not looking for Gen Z to lead the way because there's still people in Gen X and my generation that have things to say and things to do. And, and so we need to look at it as, and from a community perspective and say, what can we do as a body of people, you know, if you're the hands, be the hands. If you're the head, be the head. If you're the foot, be the foot. And do what we have to do collectively and not just look to the next generation the way we have been taught to. Oh, it's the next generation's responsibility to do this. It's the next generation. No, while we're still here, we have work to do. Oh, yes. And also let people play, play those roles and, and don't expect the artists to do everything. It's like, that's the thing I feel like, you know, well, we're putting a lot of pressure on our black artists right now as if they're not going through the same pandemonium and panini we all are going through. Um, <laughs> it's like, why can't you make a perfect film that doesn't show any horror? Because I'm, hor I'm horrified. That's why. <laughs> I'm sorry. I put, my art is real. I'm horrified. Check I'm horrified. So, I mean, I think, <laughs> I'm horrified. Red Pill is a horror movie because I, <laughs> I was like, I want to see the horror that I see. Yes. But yeah, but it's about not also going into um, the art of storytelling, you know, seeking some kind of corrective measure. Um, you know, that is not where the lib collective liberation for Black people is going to unfold. Because also, you know, and, and the idea of also, we, we, we're going to have to get into more intracommunal conversations. That's the part I'm excited about because I'm just so bored of constantly you know, speaking back to or constantly having to engage the white gaze because it really robs us of our imagination for how we envision ourselves and so that we can resolve then what is happening at an intracommunal level and we can have a conversation about what does liberation look for us because it's different for all of us right but um a movie a film a play i think that um looking for that thing to bear you know the weight of serving some kind of corrective redemption for all black people is unfair <laughs> um you know um and that is why i'm saying i mean for you Tanya, for you to tell the story, the thing that you are doing is the radical work that we are excited about. Thank you. I feel like everybody needs to tell their specific story, their specific mm -hmm. decolonized mind story, the one that they don't didn't even know that they couldn't think until their mind got so decolonized that they could see what was actually there behind all of the layers of colonization. So it's 518. We have about 12 minutes left. And the reason I started this was because all the black women I know are brilliant. Um, we're juggling a million things at once. We do everything better than everybody. If they just got out of the way and let us run the world, it would be just better for everybody. And we just step in and do what needs to be done. We don't wait to be asked. We don't wait to get credit. 
we just see something that needs to be done and we get it done. That is the black women that I know. And so I wanted to create a space, which is this space to center black women and, and have you voice and put into the world, what do you want? What do you need? There may be someone who is listening who can provide it, who can give it, who doesn't even know you, who can just anonymously give to you in the way that I know that you as black women are constantly giving. You can think for a moment, but what do you want? What do you need? You're just putting it out there. Like where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I will be. So we are, we are here and we are, we are, we're, we're, we're sort of manifesting something right here. What do you want? Center the energy on yourself. And what do you want? What do you need? What, what is out there in the world that just by putting it out there, your word is going to become law this day. Oh, I want every black woman who deserves or well, desires love in the physical manifestation to get that, to, to not be, have any hunger, touch, hung, um, touch hunger, or to, to be fulfilled, physically loved, mm-hmm. you know, down to the, all the, so you want, I'm going to put that back to you. You want that for yourself because I said for you. Yes. Not and, doing anything me, in the and, world. And because I'm starting to have that. And I'm like, mm, I, I, I forgot what, it's been such a long time. I thought I forgot that I was fine. <laughs> I want it for everybody else. But yes, I, 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 I am teaching myself to, uh, to allow it again. Because okay, so about what you. do you want? What do you want? You want to feel more of it. You want to enjoy more of it. You and want to just love, 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 love of it. physical coming not, away. Not be scared of it. Mm-hmm. What might happen if? Yes. Dot, dot, dot. Mm-hmm. Because remember, remember, remember last time, the last five times. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I'll take some of that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see, you know. And 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 I want health. I want to, uh, I, I want the the machinations of uh, white supremacy to not kill me uh, early. Hmm. Very very, uh, I really want that, and uh, I don't want to have to work so hard to keep it from it from happening. Hmm. To stop having to defend against it. Yeah, I mean, and, and I've been sitting here this whole time freaking and out with my son being. Still be able to. Uh, I mean, just this, how much how, how much uh, my health has been affected by watching the clock with my son late and not having you heard, heard from him because it got me worried too. Yeah, he's here him? now. But like that you know that. The but have you heard from him now? Is he? Yes, he's in the house. Okay, no, but but having no, that's important. But holding all that with that, you know, and trying to be <laughs> still perform while you're thinking all the th- all the things. Yes, 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 yes. The toll, I know the toll, one, yes. toll, the toll. So yeah, I want, I want, I want to be absent of that. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. Yeah. At a peace, um, you know, and um, to to have audacity. Um, you know, to just have audacity to 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 live the life that I envision for myself, um, and to abandon all fear. Um, I think that that is really what um, I desire for myself, and to cultivate that and push towards that with a sense of tenderness and gentleness. Um, I want softness. I don't want to have to, you know, I mean, of course there is struggle, but I, I no longer want the strong black woman narrative attached to my name. <laughs> you know, um, I, I want, uh, I want that for all of us. Um, and, um, yeah, to live a full life and to live it audaciously. Mm-hmm. Yes. And what can any of us give to you for that? Money. Money, 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 okay. <laughs> money. I mean, because I mean, I think that, 
Sell your cash app so people who want to donate. Oh, damn. I was, you know, I've been thinking about this thing because, and especially amongst my generation, and I think it's because um, I don't have a cash app. Um, um, I've never given out, like, my cash app details publicly. I don't know. I've been negotiating that, but my Venmo is, I I think it's at Zama Dube. But, I mean, I was talking about money in the sense that um, a lot of times when institutions are talking about supporting people, um, you know, I, we, we, oftentimes I've noticed that um, people already have what they need. They just need resources. You know, we don't need like the inspiration. Don't give me the, the advice. It's just like the resources to get me closer to the thing that I desire. Yes. I just was writing in my book, forget these mentors where you sit down and have a conversation with somebody <laughs> like you're doing them a favor when they need give it to them you see an opportunity that would help them give me with a with a college credit or a published play like i move them to the less next level no more mentoring conversations because mm-hmm. we can read books we mm-hmm. can listen to podcasts <laughs> i don't need a mentor, okay. sponsor I need a sponsor right. not a mentor yes do something Africa. I think I would have to uh, piggyback on what Zama said, and this is simply resources. Um, as an independent artist, I have been a one-man band for a long time. I've been, you know, producing my own work, and God just happened to give me a play that I'm in the works with right now that is bigger than what I could do with my own resources. And so now I'm a two-man band because Crystal uh, graciously decided to come on as um, a lead producer for this play, and so I'm speaking for her as much as I'm speaking for myself. We do need resources. We need, you know, people to you know, and to invest in this play. And I'm not just saying this because I wrote it and it's my baby, but I do think it is something that can move the needle and the conversation forward about race in America. Okay, what's the name of the play? Where do we donate? Okay, um, the name of the play is called The Fight and it takes place on the day of the first Ali Frazier fight. And um, right now I don't have a place where you could donate, but I do have a PayPal. Okay. And uh, it is Africa with a K, B as in Bravo, A as in Alpha, U as in Under, G as in Golf at yahoo.com. Okay. So oh, I'm sorry, like Africa B called eight. And don't, um, after the um, G is the number eight. Oh, Africa beat all. Drop it, drop it, so drop it in the. Uh, oh, drop it in the chat. I'll drop it in the chat. Okay. I dropped mine in the chat. Africa B A U G eight. Yes. Africa B A U G eight. Thank the you. Fight. Yes, and the name, okay. of the title of the play is the fight. Thank you, thank you. And Lisa's Venmo is Lisa B. Thompson. Lisa hyphen B hyphen Thompson, Thompson with a P T H O M P S O N. I mean, all of us just need resources. I like you, I invest in myself. I produce myself because the waiting around for somebody Mm -hmm. to put you on their leash to decide if you will jump high enough for them to give you what you want. And I've, I've noticed that people often want me to do what they want me to do but they are not willing to support me in doing what I want to do and what I'm good at doing. Yes. So um, I've never said what I wanted. Yes, I would like resources to help me do what I want to do and what I'm good at doing, what I was put here on this earth to do. Uh, I'm so grateful to you all for being in conversation with me. I want to thank Crystal Chase, who put it together. Come on, Crystal. This is our six and... Um, our, our last collaboration with HowlRound that is hosted these last six months since May. I'm grateful to everyone who's listened in. I know that I have learned a lot and been inspired and uh, grateful to meet all of you and connect with such brilliant, powerful Black women. There are so many of us out there and we've got to stay connected to each other and just stay safe and blessings to all of you as you go out into the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you for much. having us. Thank you. Thank you so much for this forum and this space. Yes, mm-hmm. I want you to have a permanent place that I could uh, a channel. It would be lovely. Yeah, this needs to be a podcast. 
I really, I, I'm, I'm going to, this Christian will film. probably, um, at the end of this, Crystal will, will give me the recording. And I do have a podcast called um, You Can't Say That, which is at vpn.fm forward slash YCST. And I will um, turn it into the audio and put it on my podcast where people who listen there can find it. That's its own story of itself. So it's not like quite academia, but it's very much like it. No, so um, thank you. Thank you, everyone who listened. <laughs> and um, you can listen again. You'll find them on all five on YouTube. This one will go up on YouTube in a couple of days. And ladies, if you'll hang on the phone when we close the live stream, um, we just have a few more things to say to you. And thank you again. Thank you, Tanya, for your vision and your generosity. Yes. Thank you. It's been a delight to be in conversation with you all um, and to learn from all of you. I'm so inspired. And to meet all of you two-headed women, because that's what we all are. <laughs> yes. Um, so yes. I'm looking forward to us um, yeah, having more conversations after this. Yeah.